<laughs> hey, thanks, Joe. Who's going to interject? I think I think he's going to do it. Okay, uh, Jack, to me, Fisher. <laughs> you ready? I'm ready. Whenever you are. He's okay. always ready. Well, welcome. We don't have many of these uh, research series left. I don't know. Is there another one after this? Is there two microphones? Some more after this. Uh, before I introduce our guest today, um, I just I do want to put a plug in for tomorrow's Ostrom Memorial Lecture. We have Dr. Monica White from University of Wisconsin Madison coming down to speak about freedom farmers and uh, how it's really a, uh, looking at how the civil rights movement and farming um, is a part of the institution building. So really looking forward to her talk tomorrow, 3 p.m. Wittenberger Auditorium in the IMU. So I hope folks can make it. Um, but without uh, delaying you any further, because we've been delayed a week because of uh, you, 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 you had to, you were sick and had to push it back. But uh, Dr. Bernie Fisher, who is a former workshop director and a longtime workshopper, and brought many of us in here, also a former state forester and a faculty member uh, here at IU, as well as um, <clears throat> as well as at Purdue University, um, uh, a while back as uh, as well. Condolences about Monday's game. Um, but uh, 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 Dr. Fish is here to talk to us um, about the Lake Association work that he's been doing for several years now in uh, northern Minnesota. So we'll turn it over to you, and then I'm happy to moderate questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for all coming, even if we had to delay things and whatever. So uh, exploring the knowledge commons of lakes, and this actually started for me a specific topic. Last year, when we started talking about knowledge commons at the workshop, which I didn't know much about, and I got interested in it, and I started thinking yeah. about this with people I talked with up in Minnesota, and somebody encouraged me up there uh, to enough that next month I'm giving a talk in Minnesota, this talk. And so this is sort of my practice. Um, so we're going to talk about lakes and the associated data and lake associations and lakes. Uh, I'm basically an academic that serves as an extension agent. My experience in academia was more as an extension, uh, that is taking research and applying it rather than being a basic researcher. Uh, and in Minnesota, that's definitely my role. I'm an extension agent. Uh, the concept of environmental commons and their associated uh, uh, knowledge base is widely talked about, so I don't need to repeat that to, to lots of people. We're going to talk about data, what becomes knowledge, and then the management implications. And then we're going to talk about COLAs, which is coalition lake associations, and then individual lake associations. Let's see something. Cool. Thought it could go earlier. It worked a little bit ago. It did. Here. Can you move it? There. All right. So uh, I'm going to give a talk in late May to the Coalition of Lake Associations in Hubbard County, Minnesota. <laughs> there are 31 lake associations in that coalition. In Minnesota, there are 21 counties that have a coalition of lake associations. So it's a fairly common thing in Minnesota, specifically northern Minnesota. Uh, these lake associations, uh, the coalitions normally meet monthly, one representative from each lake association, although some lake associations will send two or three representatives. Uh, the themes of their meetings are education, interaction with stakeholders, and then sometimes some action items, particularly action items interfacing with the state government, local government, or whatever. In our coalition, I am the lone academic of the 31 representatives. Uh, people call me the professor or whatever because there's nobody else that has any al alignment to universities at all. And they've tapped into me over time, once they discovered who I was, uh, to give uh, talks, lead discussions. And actually, uh, when I was still teaching at SPIA, I had two capstone courses that did a capstone with the coalition. One was under water quality management monitoring program, and another one was just under kind of organizational structure which were fascinating for the students because they were dealing with a real world problem and they couldn't walk across the street and talk to them. They were a 14 hour drive away. So everything had to be phone and inter Zoom. So it was a really good experience. Uh, my purpose of this is to you know, talk about lake associations as they create an act and you know, create have access to data. They might use the word manage. 
but they never use the word govern. In fact, they abhor the word govern. And like associations don't think they govern and don't want to govern, even though they're involved in government more than they ever may. So it's a very <laughs> careful about using that term. Uh, commons, everybody knows what commons are, governed by both formal and informal rules. Uh, lake associations are a perfect example of this. The lake association is made up generally just of the people who live on the lake, not people who live off the lake. So it's very much people involved in the lake. And some lake associations are, the lakes are big enough that they actually divide up into neighborhoods. And the neighborhood on the north end of the lake will talk about things and then bring it to the attention. Of the, so it's a very interesting dynamic. Uh, I use I bring up the word tragedy of the commons because tragedy of the commons in lakes is more common than people think it is. And uh, this is what lake associations many times form initially because there's a problem. The lake's becoming polluted. Uh, there's overfishing on the lake. They don't like the excessive boating, particularly by people who don't live on the lake, but launch on a public lake. And so that's the reason lake associations form many times. The lake I live on, the big man trap lake, which I'll highlight a few times in the talk, the lake association formed in 1956. So that's how old lake associations get, but the second oldest one in the county. And they formed because they thought there was a weed problem in the lake, too many weeds. They had a couple of warm summers and we, well, the weed problem kind of went away. And then they just now, it, it became a social organization for a long time. The coalitional lake associations in Upper County formed uh, in 1988. And the coalition formed because enough people were organizing. They said, we ought to get together. Uh, degrading of water quality is, is a current concern. You'll see that highlighted later on in my talk. Uh, there's an abundance of data about lakes collected by a variety of people, which I'll highlight. And it's been collected over long periods of time. So there's a history of data. That's what's really intriguing to me as an academic is how much data is out there. And it's solid data. It's not just happenstance where it's collected every year at the same time. It's really good. The data can be summarized to create information. I'll show you a couple examples of how that's been done. Also indicate to you some places that hasn't been done very well. And the information creates knowledge at the lake level or at a coalitional lake levels. And for instance, in a countywide, uh, the county uh, government may look at all the lakes that have data and say, what trend are we seeing in all the lakes that have data? Knowledge can obviously be utilized to benefit the lakes. Uh, many times, uh, that's where things kind of fall apart. So I'm going to divide the data of, I summarize into two slide, two different sections of the talk. So this is part one. And this is data that I would say is more collected, not by the lake association, but by others and utilized. So uh, aquatic invasive species, I'll use the term AIS quite a bit, is, is an ongoing problem right now. The introduction of, of species that are not native, that create all kinds of problems, create imbalances in lakes. You may have heard of zebra mussels as an example that got into the Great Lakes from Europe. But these, these are, it's, it's become almost every year there's a new invasive species we're talking about. Uh, and there is a, a couple systems that they track these. I'll show you in the next slide. Uh, land use history. We have aerial photography in this country back to at least the 1930s. And so you can track the, the land use history around lakes, looking at aerial photos over time. I'll show you an example of this. And particularly in areas that are switching and changing from forest cover to agricultural cover, it's dramatic. Uh, septic system upgrades, uh, that's something that's been really interesting in Minnesota. I'll show you a little bit about that. So we'll have examples of these on the next slides. So in <laughs> Minnesota, most states, most lakes that are, have a public access have someone who is there part of the time to monitor the boats to come in and out of the access. And the theme has been aquatic invasive species. And so they're checking a boat when it comes in to make sure the boat and the boat, the apparatus they launch the boat with, have no invasive species on them. And then when it comes, when the boat comes out of the lake at the end of the day, these are particularly people coming in for day use. They're looking at the boat to see, has it got an invasive species on it that we don't know about? And it's a new way to find them. Uh, so inspecting boats for AIS has become not just a way to check to see if they've caught, the, caught too many fish. It's much more important now for AIS. 
they've been now putting this data, the University of Minnesota has got some people looking at the data to figure out how to map the data over time. And they've got what they call the AIS Explorer, which basically tracks data of, you know, they, the, 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 the people at the launch site record where the boats came from. So you know the previous launching spot the boat came from. So now you can see where, if you have a lake that has lots of boats coming from somewhere else and you get an invasive species, where did it come from or where could it come from? So it's become very interesting. So this is an, just an example, and I'll blow this up in a minute. This is the county that I'm in in Minnesota. This is Hubbard County. This happens to be a big lake in the next county over called Malox. Malox has almost every invasive species known to mankind. All right. It's really, it just, it, 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 it's unbelievable. So this was just for one invasive species, zebra mussels. So these are the lakes in the county that have zebra mussel in them, which it is the assumption is they came from the big lake. All right, then they've, they've, they've been monitoring the, the boats that move out. And the, the lakes that are yellow have a fair number of boats that are coming from here or other lakes with it with zebra mussels. So they're warning those lakes, you could get, you could get it. The lakes with green, you're not seeing very many boats coming from waters that are infested. So you're at least lower risk. So it's a risk rating system. It's a very interesting system to look at. They actually have it now for three or four different AIS species. This is just the one I've used for zebra mussel. So you just blow it up a list, this blows it up a little more. And for instance, the lake that I live on is right there and it's yellow. We have one of the highest uh, inputs of boats from, uh, from other lakes coming to our lake. We have a high you know, number of boats coming from other lakes because we are a musky lake, which is big time fishing. And because of that, we're, we're a threat. And, we, and the risk is high and we're worried about it. And because of that, we monitor our, our ramp much more than some other lakes in terms of, we pay extra money from our lake association to pay the, the monitor to be there more often. It's an interesting system, all computer-based, based on uh, 10 years of data. So very much data rich, and then it provides information to guide you where it can be. All right, land use change over time. And uh, I interviewed a couple people from the county and uh, our county is actually, uh, as is much of Minnesota, uh, the southern part of our county is very agricultural and has been agricultural since almost 1900. So it's not like agriculture is a new thing, but it has been changing a little bit recently. The switch to irrigation happened in the 1980s to 2000. They can pretty much find that that's when it started. That meant more intensive agriculture, more fertilizer, more pesticides, so a higher risk to lakes because of that. So there are data available from the 1930s to 78 at the University of Minnesota uh, on aerial photography, and then the county has imagery from 1991 to 2023. As to whether irrigation and, and the intensification has really degraded lakes yet, the county people were not willing to take a, make a statement to it, but it was interesting. So just to give an example, this is a section of, of a, a major lake in the county. This is 1978 photography. This is all ag over here. It's not much ag over here. But the difference is in 2023, these circles are irrigation circles. There are no irrigation circles over here. This is a lake that actually their water quality measurements show they're starting to degrade. Not they, 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 it's, it's marginal have degrade, but this lake is actually degrading a little bit, and it's an area dominated by agriculture. So you can, if you can pull that up in your lake, you can look and very much see. Okay, well, how are we doing? And people that live right on a lake, the forested buffer, right along the lake, they live there and they drive this. They'll drive a road like this, but they really think that they're protected because of that buffer there. And that buffer may be 100 yards wide, 50 yards wide. So they're not really thinking about it. But if you show it as an aerial photography, you know, all of a sudden they go, oh, damn. Mm -hmm. And it's it's changed dramatically in the last few years. All right, another threat to lakes, and this is a, a little odd photo. Um, we have lakes where people have taken a, a, a portion of the, of the shoreline 
and we're going to make it a campground. Or maybe it was formerly a resort. We're going to make it a campground. So we're going to intensify the use on the lake. And this is a lake in our county called Pickerel Lake. And this is a proposal to put a boat launch site with, uh, I don't know, about 10, 10 launches there for a new campground that they proposed. It's a land use change. It had to go through the county. And the county basically said, you're doing everything right. You're going to put in, uh, you're putting in two septic systems to, to manage to manage the septic of the use. But the residents on the lake said, wait a minute, this is going to increase boat traffic. And we're going to have all these people from somewhere else coming in and they're going to drive their boats fast and all that kind of stuff. Can you restrict what those boat users do? And basically, the county said to them, if you want to change the boat use on your lake, it's for everyone, not just for the campground. You don't make it for the campground. Do all of the residents on the lake don't have a speed limit or have no, or have, have no, you know, and, and the lake search says, whoa, I don't think we want to try that. And part of it is the lake search says, we don't want to govern. So this is going to happen this summer. This is just in the process of happening right now. I've been following it and uh, it'll be a major change. All right, so septic systems. And as you can imagine, in rural Minnesota, septic systems are a way of life. And in the early 1990s, and I wasn't aware of this too much until I got to talk to some people there, the county discovered that we have a lot of failing septic systems, particularly around lakes. And so the county in introduced a system of, of investigating and looking at every septic system in the county because it had a record if you had a septic system. If you didn't have a septic system in the record base, they found you. <laughs> All right. And so between 1990 and 2004, about four, they checked every system in a, in a county. And if you weren't up to standard, they required you to bring your septic system up to standard. That's a huge change. So the program was incredibly successful. The county made the, made the comment to me was, we rarely see a septic system in shoreline areas these days deemed to be failing in a submittance of compliance report. It's if you're upgrading your cabin or whatever and you have to get your system up, they said, we don't see any failed systems at all anymore. If you look at water quality monitoring data in the county for lakes that have monitored data for 40 years, there's a little bump positive that this lake's got clearer right after this time period. It, was, it, it actually shows up in water quality data. Again, an amazing statistic that unless you know about it, long-term residents may not even be aware that they did this. And they used to have, you know, they used to have tanks without a bottom. They had 55-gallon drums rather than a tank. I mean, it had all kinds of bad things. And that's all gone away. So that's Data number one. Data number two is more lake association based. This is lake association collects this type of data. We're going to talk about water quality clarity over time. We're going to talk about how the DNR and lakes talk about fisheries. And then we'll hint at some other things that cl close up we may want to talk about. So lake associations, one of the things they do regularly, I do that on my lake, I'm the representative, Every week I go out and I take a water clarity reading at the exact same spot, 20 weeks in a row in the summer. Five times a summer, I collect a water quality sample and I send it to a lab along with every other lake association in the county. Our lake has been doing this since sometime in the 19, uh, 1990s, consistently every summer. So we've got a whole lot of samples. And this is the kind of data I do primary site one, we don't do the other two sites very often. And this is the kind of data that comes back, data. And you can look at, you see total phosphorus. This is from, from the data that's collected two, five times a summer. The chlorophyll, the secchi reading, that's the water clarity reading, that's done every, every week. So you got this whole big data sheet that the lab sends out once a year to the Lake Association, updating where we've been for the, you know, whatever 20 years. Most of the Lake Association people look at this data sheet and go, you know, what does that mean? What does it So a couple of years ago, the lab said, oh, well, we can do some summaries, particularly if we have 10 years or more data. 
we'll do some statistical analysis for you and we'll put it in a table that's more readable. And so for my like, we got years monitor, 1997, 2023, total phosphorus. It hasn't changed. No significant change. Okay, that's interesting. Chlorophyll, no significant change. Secchi depth, no different change. Same as clear as it was, 97 is 2003. Tropic state. These are the last couple are good. Everything, and then within a range of a comparison region, everything is within the expected range. That is useful information, not just data, mm -hmm. that you can give to Lake Association people to go, oh. But then what Lake Association people say, well, how are other lakes doing? So I pulled up two other lakes, Stony Lake and Fishhook Lake, in, in, in both in the county. So Stony Lake, it's improving in phosphorus. It's improving in chlorophyll. Improving as the depth that you can take a reading. It's getting clear. Trophic state is included. Total phosphorus better than expected in the range, within the range. So there's a lake that's improving. It's an interesting lake. Fishhook Lake, very near the, the major town in the county and very near lots of agricultural and residential development. Declining with 90% confidence. Secchi depth is improving, which is interesting. The clarity is getting clearer, but it's declining. Sophic state declining. Within range, within range, within range. So here's a lake that's not doing quite so well. And they're a little concerned. There's a couple other lakes, small lakes in the county. One is surrounded by irrigation systems, and it's degrading faster than this. But this is the way to take information and make it useful. And he said, we've got this now for 31 Lake Association, which actually is about 42 lakes we've got for the county. There's also uh, the Department of Natural Resources has a, a big website. I'm not going to go through all these things because there's too many things on the site. But they have what they call the Lake Finder site. And you can you get data about the, you know, the lake. You get all the species of fish that they've ever trapped in the lake. You can look up a fisheries lake survey. That is, they've done surveys, what the surveys are. You can look at where the water access sites is. Can you launch a boat on that lake? You look and say, do they stock fish? When do they stock them? How often do they stock them? When does the ice go in? And when does the ice go out? By the way, the ice went out three weeks early in Minnesota this year. It set all kinds of records. It's a crazy warm year up there, like here. You can look and say, are there any guidelines on fish consumption, the water levels, lake health, and whatever. So you can look at all kinds of information Again, very, it's over, can be overwhelming, but for somebody that's interested in one of those specific things, like well, what's the fishing like or whatever, it's all possible. So this is just for Big Man Trap Lake, again, the lake I live on. This is fishing regulations. And so it's interesting. There's a couple of things that have happened in my lake over time. This lake has some special fishing regulations, different than statewide. And the fishing regulations were, were adjusted about 15 years ago because a couple of a couple of species of fish were threatened, and they be too it was a little overfishing. So the daily limit for crappies on the lake is five. The statewide general level is ten, but they reduced it to five on this lake, and they've kept it at five for fifteen years. And they think the crappie population has responded positively to that. Northern pike, which is a major game fish in the lake, all northern pike between twenty four and thirty six inches must be immediately released. You can keep one for the record book if you want to, bigger than 36 inches. And the, the average size when they when they trap fish every year, the average size in a northern pike in the last couple of years, the last 20, last 15 or 20 years, has increased by about two inches, which is significant in a fish population. And that means more fish reach breeding capacity. So it's a good thing. And then they list invasive species. My lake has one duration, your water buffalo. So knowledge applications, what, what has all this information and knowledge done? So what has happened on AIS, because we know now we have a, the lakes are at risk, the, the, the person who monitors boats at the lake, at the launch site, is paid for by government. And depending on how much use you get, you get a certain number of hours during the fishing season. And on lakes where there's a threat, Lake associations have raised extra money to give to the county to increase the number of hours. 
on my link association, we raised we raise annually fifteen thousand extra dollars to pay salary to get more to get more inspections. It's not nickels and dimes now. Fifteen thousand dollars from one hundred plus lake, lake residents. That's a that's a significant number. So the other thing that lakes have done, lakes have organized their their citizens. They find someone who's a good leader, and they train them on it in basically finding invasive species. And then they do sampling around the lake. Every year, structure a sampling system where they may sample, particularly lakes, places where boats are launched. And they now sample to see if they can find invasive species early so that you might be able to treat them. Again, yeah, very, very interesting system. For the, the fish, uh, the DNR, uh, the Department of Natural Resources, basically controls fishing on lakes. And uh, they will give some guidance to lakes and we've had a couple of lakes in our county. One is particularly is Pickerel Lake, which basically had their panfish kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It's a very good panfish lake. Everybody was catching the 20 year out a day, a day every day, keeping 20 every day. And so the Lake Association sat down with the county about four years ago and said, can we reduce the, the number you keep? And basically the DNR said, if your Lake Association will approve it, We'll consider it. The Lake Association took a vote and everybody said, yeah, we'd like to. And now it's only five. And they read it in 20. And so the DNR, when the DNR is the, the, the sheriff or the DNR is after monitoring boats, checking the boat, they're now checking to see you only have five in a boat per person per license. Uh, watershed knowledge has been, uh, it's interesting because I don't think people quite know what to do with the watershed knowledge yet. But they're becoming knowledgeable that we've got more, you know, got all these irrigation systems out there. Uh, most of them don't know that the, the septic systems really got approved at one time. So they blame it. Everything they blame now is, is agriculture, which is an interesting phenomenon in the state of Minnesota, which has got a very strong agricultural economy. Uh, and they come up with a system where if your watershed is 75% protected, that is 75% in forests and wetlands, that is not in ag and not in development. They figure that at that point you're you're protected. We have a, a one link in our county because of the conservation easements and stuff they've done to just achieve seventy five percent status, and it got a lot of visibility in the media because it's the first lake that had that status in the watershed. We're not talking about Lake Shore now. We're talking about the watershed, and so other lakes are now saying, "Well, what does seventy five percent mean?" And then, how much are we? And like my lake is 57% protected, probably because it got a big chunk of state forest land that protects a bunch of it. But so it's interesting. So, you know, other things could come to mind, but those are some applications. A couple of close out slides. So when I meet with the Lake Association people, part of my discussion with them, leading a discussion is, all right, what questions do you have? You know, how does knowledge become available to the stakeholders? And stakeholders are your residents. Stakeholders could be government. You may know something government doesn't know. The county, particularly, could be the township or it could be the state. But also your visitors. You have lots of people that come launch boats at your lake. You have vacation rentals by owners. What should they know? And so you, you have news stories. You have the DNR, which makes regular announcements about fishing and whatever. Uh, there are county government updates, particularly on things like land use. Uh, lake associations have newsletters and lake associations generally have one to two summer meetings so you could bring in someone to talk about some of the data and then there's just general word of mouth but lake associations don't think about governing and thinking about spreading the knowledge out there very well yet that's something they've got to spend more time on and so what i'm going to encourage them to think about is that you got to engage with all the actors you got to share your knowledge in any way possible. Uh, and then you may think about this knowledge commons associated with lakes and say, what don't we know? Is there a question out there about something we don't know anything about? And it could be things like the wildlife on our lake. Uh, the state bird in Minnesota is the loon. I don't know how many people know what a loon is. And loons on some lakes are really popular. On other lakes, they almost never see them. But why don't you have loons versus another lake that does? And then could you engage actors in possible decisions or actions? That becomes the trick. Questions. 
I won't see them. But it's not. Start off, I was, um, I'll be trying to monitor online and uh, here in person, but does anybody have a question to start us off? Students have priority, I guess. Oh, yes, 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 of course, absolutely. Gustavo, did you? No. <laughs> I have a question. But yeah, uh, students, students have priority, uh, priority shot at Bernie Fisher here. Okay, Gary, what's your question? I was wondering if you've looked at anything about building on the lakes. Because here in Indiana, especially with the pandemic, it seems like there's more and more and more living room on the lake. Well, in, in, in many counties in Minnesota, they have a shoreline ordinance at the county level. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they get a permit if you want to do any construction or any rehab of what you've got on your lake, uh, on your property. And I can tell you that anything within 100 feet of the lake you, you can't add anything at all, anything within 100 feet of the lake. And so the shoreline ordinance, which has been strengthened at least twice that I know in the last 10 years, really has controlled development very well. Is that the state? I'm sorry, is that a state ordinance or? A county. County. But there were a couple of counties in central Minnesota that were the models. And I know our county adopted one that another county had already done originally, but they were tinkering with it. The latest is uh, the, the ordinance now is affecting uh, vacation rentals by owner. People during the pandemic started renting their houses out, whatever. Well, what the county was, the county looked at all the vacation rentals listed on the website and said, all right, how big is your septic system? Your septic system only allows you to rent it to three people. And they were advertising for like six. And so that, that became really big, really big deal. And Lake Association is basically very supportive of the, of the, of the ordinance. So that hasn't, there's been no challenge to Lake Association. The other part of it was um, some uh, cabins or residences are right on a county road. And the only place they had to park was on a county road. And the sheriff said, that's illegal. And so and they started enforcing that. And that really changed. And I got some people very mad at the sheriff. But the sheriff said, I don't, you know, I'm sorry, I'm, my road's going to be safe. Well, we have Gustavo, Julia, and Jim Luke then online. So Gustavo, well, super interesting presentation. So it's, um, I, I was thinking. So I have kind of a, a comment about the uh, maybe some uh, parallel with uh, some theoretical tools that could be useful to to think about this this case. So the so the lake associations they are not uh, governing or managing the lake. Okay, and they don't in, want in, in general. Say, okay? In general, they don't. They don't. Right. So what they look more, they kind of organize to uh, petition to state governments, uh, counties, whoever has actual uh, governing power uh, to change things. Okay, and they are well respected. Okay, mm -hmm. well that has essentially for me, uh, a, it's kind of a lobby problem now. So you are organ, which is a collective action problem, no? Um, and 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 I think some of what lobbyist groups do, do in these cases is to provide information to policymakers to move things. Okay, I know that the you know the theory of lobby is kind of you know people immediately have a, a negative connotation, but but that's not necessarily the case. If you are pushing for a good outcome, lobby is good indeed. So what I'm thinking with this approach, okay? So essentially, um, what these guys are doing is solving a collective action problem um, to uh, move things uh, in, in, in a particular direction. They're essentially looking like, uh, like a lobby group, OK? Um, uh, and then uh, you use all the Ostrom tools because that's a collective action problem. Um, and then, you know, lobby groups, they, many activities are very similar. You know, it's like they, they collect information, they provide information to policymakers, uh, they collect contributions, and sometimes, well, maybe in this case it's not campaigns, but they are financing, but they are subsidizing, monitoring of some activity that they care about. So at the end, it's, 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 it would be really interesting to trace this parallel, no? Yeah, the, the one dilemma will be, is the Lake Association will say, the county ought to do this. And the county says, that's not our responsibility. That's your, if you want to gather your folks together to uh, not have abusive uh, boat behavior, 
you know, as long as it's legal, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to, you know, and so that's where the county can go back to the lake association and say, this is your challenge, not ours. And that's what gets lake associations, uh, you know, somebody in the lake association says, well, good, we'll stand up. And uh, and the majority of the lake association says, no, 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 we don't do that. That's so good. that's that's one of the real dynamics that I see. One just quick follow up. So, and then in those lakes that things are failing versus in, in those lakes that they are more successful, one way of thinking is like collective action is failing in one case and, and then collective action is not failing in our case, but it's not the collective action of managing the lake. Mm -hmm. It's our lobbying in a successful way those that have the ability to make serious decisions. Thank you. That's, that's, that's a good thought. Julia. Thanks. Those were really <clears throat> thought-provoking questions. And Bernie, thank you for putting together this talk and working with the lakes of Minnesota. Um, you might have said this in the beginning, but I wondered, are many of the lakes the source of tap water? And if so, are the water operators represented on the lake associations? Uh, there are no, let's see. Everybody on the lake will, will have a well. They don't use the water, they don't use water directly from the lake, they, it's wells. Uh, and the city water system in the, the small town, in the biggest town area is about 3,000 people. It's all well driven. So there's no, no water from lakes goes into tap water. Why is that? Well, one, in Minnesota, water is plentiful. Wells are shallow. You don't have to do it. It's not like we're a 20 foot well gets all the water you want. That's one of the reasons agricultural irrigations become big. Water is cheap and it's easy to get. It's everywhere. <laughs> So that's not relevant. This tie, like we have here with Lake Monroe being our yes. source of water. And but water we have no, we have, we do not have any lakes. In fact, uh, the other thing is there are no, think about that a second, there are no reservoirs in the county. Every lake's a natural lake. In Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes, reservoirs are, they're just, there are a few down by the Twin Cities, but that's the only place I can think of being reservoirs at all. Uh, we'll go online with uh, Jim Luke, if you want to unmute yourself. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, first of all, fascinating talk, and I, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm a professor at a community college in Michigan, uh, and I study knowledge commons. And I thought I had two questions, but the first one may be not so I'll just test what I'm thinking here you can agree or show me where I'm wrong which is when you first started talking I was wondering if there was a um, conflict between if the associations were just uh, landholders on the shore um, there'd be some conflict between public use of the lake and their desire to control the lake mm -hmm. and you know but it sounds like what i'm now hearing from you is actually the association's reluctance to quote govern and the fact that most of those rules or laws have to be done by state or county is what provides the kind of safety valve so that the the commons of the landowners on the shore don't turn into uh, a group that encloses the public lake and takes it away from the the public access. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah. So, so to give you an idea of the uh, thirty-one uh, lake associations, three do not have public access. Twenty-eight okay. do. Wow. So the three that don't have public access are very different. Because there's there they have no worries about the invasive species, but they also get no support from the DNR for fisheries because there's no public access on the lake. Oh, so this so that's a very distinct difference between lakes with public access versus lakes without public access. The DNR strives to get public access on any lake it can, but the DNR has to own land to put that access in. And those three lakes, I can tell you, have no interest in having you know, public access on their lakes. Okay. So so the other question I had was, um, I, I really like how you've framed this as knowledge commons. 
and focused on the knowledge of the data or of the lakes as if, if you will, the common pool. Um, and, and feeding it, I'm wondering, it's one thing to have all this data uh, available and collected and so on like that. But it seems to me there's another piece to the knowledge aspect, which is um, you may understand what all this data is, but you're after all, quote, the professor. Most of the folks that own property on the lakes and are in the associations may not, re I mean, you know, presumably they have backgrounds in something else. So I was just curious, has there been any move or connection to um, say community colleges or high schools or whatever as kind of an educational effort so that people that move in and grow up understand this ongoing pool of data. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Well, uh, the president of the Coalition Lake Associations, who's who's quite good uh, and engages with me fairly often about a number of issues, she is she's excited about this presentation uh, and uh, wants me a paper to to that paper that I've written that I really didn't want to write anything. And she said, oh, you got to write something. She's going to send that paper out two weeks before I give the presentation. So she's hoping there'll be a good discussion. And that what you suggest you know, will actually start happening on some of the some of the lakes. I know of one lake because I've dealt with one individual. They've tinkered in this already. I mean, they've thought about this a little bit more broadly, but there's a bunch of lakes I don't think have thought about it at all. So no, I th this could start something, and it could get me in trouble uh, because there are. I was telling someone for the talk today. There are twenty other coalitions of lake associations, and they exchange ideas now and then. They actually meet once a year, and someone's going to say, "Well, this guy named Fisher gave his great talk. He ought to come and give it a few more times." And that's the last thing I want to do in my summer: <laughs> is roam around <laughs> giving talks. But it may happen, and we'll see. <laughs> You're going to have to put in the fine print, winter talk only. Well, that or, uh, you know, my, my fee is $1,000 or something like that, you know, <laughs> which, which will basically get shot down immediately. Let's be done from vote. That's so, great. Uh, Thank you very much. I, I got McGinnis and then Dan and then Charlie. I'm going to change things a little bit here. I was I went to school at the University of Minnesota, but not, not up in the area. You are. And I always found it fascinating, this tradition of ice fishing out there. Uh, is there a totally separate regime for the ice fishing season, uh, or you still have inspections uh, or anything like that? Sort of how's that how's that work, and so does that fit into this? Yeah, that fits into it. And I will tell you, in the last three year, I think it's three years, ice fishermen uh, they're a different breed of cat. They're generally most of them are not residents, and okay. they bring an ice house out and plant it out there for two months. And typically come to the ice house. Well, a lot of guys come out there every evening to fish after work and drink a beer and whatever. They become very messy, littering. So there's a strong effort the last three years to basically clean up your act. And Lake Association has been pushed. Because in the spring when ice goes out, there's stuff floating around the lake. And so there's actually a, a quite a movement to, to, to focus on cleaning up your act. And it's become very strong. And several of the ice fishery fishing, I'll say associations and ice tournaments have bought into this and said, yeah, we should do this. So no, so that's really that's really just changed. And that's a really recent phenomenon. Yeah. Is everything dead, dead, Bernie, in the winter? Is everything dead in the winter? Like if you have a trucks or I mean a lot of people might drive their trucks out on the lakes. Could they be tracking stuff or is it oh, yeah, that, that'd be in their and, and when they move their ice house, they, they just leave whatever's there. Uh, and you have to think about in a good winter, and in Minnesota, a good winter is thick ice. Uh, <laughs> the ice can be four feet thick. So you can drive anything in the world out on that ice. This year, with, with a very mild winter, they actually had trucks driving through the ice. And it was a, they had three or four fatalities, and they actually had to shut the ice fishing season down very early in many parts of the state. The, the sheriff said, we can't, I can't save any more people. That's a very different phenomenon, but no, it's part of the, yeah, part of the, part of the system. Okay. Yeah, Dan here, who's up next, then Charlie. 
Uh, yeah, just a, a couple technical uh, questions about um, uh, lakes and navigability for purposes of of potential state regulation. Are any of the larger lakes considered navigable water bodies for? No. So no, no, no. There, there are in the lower part of the state, the Mississippi River is navigable. Uh, that's about, the, there's a couple of tributaries in Mississippi, but no lakes are navigable, none. I've got th three pages here listing navigable waters of the United States and Minnesota. And some of them more or less, there are some more lakes. Mm -hmm. I'll talk about that later. The other question is, so the only hook the state really needs is to is to own any amount of riparian land, which could include a road. Yes, right. Right. So apparently, those private lakes, there's been no road through a long the road lake. to the houses. Is is uh, the houses are next to the lake, and the roads behind them, and the road may be a county road, not a state road, or may not even be a public road. <clears throat> And uh, I can tell you, because I'm on the board of a land trust up there, uh, the state is actively working with land trusts. If there's a piece of land coming up for sale on a lake that doesn't have access, they will go to the land trust and say, can you buy that piece of land quickly because it's on the market? We will eventually buy it from you. It takes us a few years to get to the legislature so that we can put it in public access. I, I know of two properties right now that, the land trust I'm on the board of is just working on right now. Yeah. Are they allowed to have restrictive covenants against land trusts purchasing mm -hmm. lands in their titles? In general, land trusts are, are viewed in Minnesota as very positive because they protect land. They put easement, conservation easement on. So land trusts are view, viewed as we're protecting the watershed. But if and you're a homeowner on a private I understand on that one private lake, I, I, that's be an interesting question. And the one lake I would think about, I know one lake, I know one lake there, there, there's a negotiation going on. That could be interesting. That could be an interesting question. On the other hand, having the land protected and not be developed is a real positive. Not only is it positive because the lake stays cleaner, but my house is worth more because there's no more no houses on the lake. Yeah. So I, Bernie, it's great. And they're lucky. I'm, I'm just finding myself going, wow, they're really lucky to have you in this. You know, <laughs> um, I've got uh, several things I'll, I'll say, try to say really quickly. The first one, I'll just piggyback to that point. Um, I, I found myself thinking about, I think Daniel DeCaro has been here before. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we, we, I found myself thinking up. about his phrase, which I love, state reinforced self-governance. Mm -hmm. And the example of the fish catch rules and the DNR support of that was an example of that. And I found myself in the knowledge common side thinking about the, what, um, the AIS system and all the other data. And to the point that was made by the online visitor, I found myself a little bit, I think I understand what some of that chemical results mean, you know, if it's, but it, it felt to me like they have to go one level further in terms of what is, you know, high phosphorus mean for the lake um and but the the larger thought is again with this kind of idea of state reinforced self-governance you could see them expanding um if there's this data being collected outside of the invasive species stuff to create dashboards web dashboards for these associations that would build off of that report that point gets to one of my first questions which i think you summarized in your last slide but you know what's your goal for this presentation um and i just want to hear a little bit again like are you, you there it seems like what you're trying to convey is there's real opportunities here or knowledge commons for these land associations is that kind of the yeah, main I, message I, you're trying to i think a, a goal is to expand their horizons in terms of what they might do but mm -hmm. think about it. and i think about it both at my local, my one lake association, I mean, but one coalition. Yeah. My lake association is a rather, it's an old lake association, and it's not a real aggressive lake association. And uh, I have to be careful once in a while when I go to a board meeting or because I want them to just be a little more active, and that's just not the nature of my lake. There are a few lakes that are more aggressive, and they will jump on this. Uh, a comment about the, the water quality data, because you brought that up, mm -hmm. is that 
the lab that we, that we have, there's a private laboratory that takes the, the water samples and processes them. And then they give the data to the state. And the state is the one that produces it. But the lab has become very good at figuring out how to put the data in a more usable form. And the state is basically encouraging the lab to do that. It is, I'll say, rewriting a contract with them. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very interesting lab. And they do, <clears throat> they don't do all the water samples in the in the, in the state, but they do about well, at least 10 or 12 of the Coalition of Lake Association's water samples. So it's a huge, it's a huge mm -hmm. endeavor and they've become very good at it. I'm, I'm very respectful of that lab, they're really good. Sir, can I follow up with? Yeah, you, oh, go ahead, and then I want to follow up on this. And, um, so the state reinforced self-governance should be self-management in this case, right? Yeah. Um, given their, their, their language. Um, so one of the questions I, I kind of, I understand things that these associations can somewhat control, like how much that, that idea, but... I guess I was focusing on the agriculture issue because I, what, what, what typically is the geographic footprint of the association? And if you've got actors adjacent, like those circles, agriculture circles, so what what, what can associations do? That's a, that's a really good question. In, in, in general terms, the Lake Association is only involved with people who, the, the residences, the properties that touch the lake. The residents on the lake, that, that's as far as their reach tends to go in terms of transferring information and whatever. But the, the, the state has divided the count, the divided, uh, changed how they manage, think about managing water. They used to have county boundaries, was so everything was managed. Well, lakes don't obey the counties. So they've changed the look of things. Now they manage by watershed. So my, for instance, my county has watersheds that touch five different counties. And so the, each of those watersheds now becomes a really, and these are big lake watersheds. We're not talking about a small lake. We're talking, so these watersheds are big and they may include multiple lakes. My lake is in part of a, a chain of 13 lakes. And so uh, they're trying to get lakes to think about, all right, your chain rather than just the individual. And for instance, in my chain, we're the uppermost lake. And I, I play golf with some guys who are in the lower lake. And they go, damn it, Fisher, every time our lake degrades, it's because you guys up above are dumping something in our lake, you know, whatever. And so there is a little bit of that discussion starting. That's probably five or 10 years down the road to really get there. But it's a whole different way to think about things. And I'll just close with this. Uh I found this, you know, from a research standpoint, what a great opportunity for a grad student here or somebody to do, you know, one or more thesis around this. And, um, you know, I found myself thinking about the, the constitutional collective choice and operational rules within each one of these in comparative. And um, I have this idea of what I call policy maker spaces. So the idea of open sourcing policy and sharing innovations. And so, you know, if you could kind of study the, action, the critical action situation, I'm going to be talking some, on Monday, very much related to this, actually. Um, I'll be thinking IAD and thinking about this kind of thing. But um, the idea of, you know, uh, having somebody studying samples of these, or, or I don't know, well, I could do all of them. But what an opportunity. And to study how they govern themselves, how they, and, and the innovations that they're doing to they're hitting common problems, I'm sure. So anyway, great. Thanks. I talked too long. Sorry. Oh no, no. I mean, you can't brought up all of my questions. Like, I had three questions. One was about like how do you get people in the watershed involved? And but okay, so this might be too too much in the weeds. But on your slide about Fish Hook Lake, from my interpretation, the the water clarity is increasing, but the lake's becoming more eutrophic. I don't understand how that works. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I could. I could explain that. Okay. But if the lake and that lake does not, if you had zebra mussels, mm -hmm. zebra mussels filter are are filters, and so you could actually have a lake getting. And they, if you get zebra mussels, you're like one of the positives is your lake becomes clearer. Okay. Even though you may have a lot of other bad things going on with the zebra mussel, whatever. So there's a conflict there, and I don't know. I don't know that. 
Okay. Yeah, I was, I was just curious because usually the, the clarity goes down as, you know, it becomes more like eutrophic. Okay, okay. But that, I, I was just, yeah, interested in that. Um, and a question that I don't, you know, not, not to answer here, but I do, and I think our, the online guest, uh, Jim, brought up, and or this made me think of it, is how these rules can perpetuate more of a, a class system based on financial constraints as they seal off public access. And so while lake associations are doing good things to protect, I mean, you're, you're focused on the environment, like water quality, you know, but at the same time, it's, it's really creating this uh, more of a class system. Um and it can can be, and and obviously that's more on the very much on the human dimension side. And so, uh, just a question that comes to mind. And we're almost out of time, but there was a comment uh, that uh, Anthony Demott uh, shared, and and uh, sort of the the gist of it is um, his interpretation is that there are good examples of these lake communities working through self governance and collective action when they're really not problems that are tragedy of the commons, but there's just problems that they're overcoming. Like the zebra mussels that maybe came from the, you know, the, the freighters from Europe got dumped into the Great Lakes. And it's not because the lake is being overused. It just is by happenstance a secondary effect of, of globalism. And, and so, but they're working to overcome that. And so it was just sort of saying, you know, it, it, this commons management is more than overcoming the tragedy of the commons, but it's good collective action on environmental management. Uh, and Aaron, but, but the, dilemma, Anthony, um, the dilemma with AIS is, is that people don't clean their boats when they take it out of one lake before they take it to another lake. And in fact, uh, like the county, many counties now have a steam system somewhere located in the county where you can go in and steam clean your, your boat before you move to the next lake. And it's free. Don't charge. You have to take your boat there, and everything. but it's to try to reduce the amount of spread of invasive species. And people are sloppy, and people just don't think about the water milfoil and right. yeah, right. okay. Mm -hmm. We're kind of out of time. Um, thank you very much, Doctor. Oh, oh, response back to I apologize. Uh, our friend over there. So just to close. <laughs> so you can't shut him down. This, <laughs> this is. Um, it's not an area of research of mine. Yeah, you know, I'm doing this. I mean, I'm an old guy. I'm retired, and this is just an interest area. And so, you're talking about finding a student that would work on this. Mm -hmm. uh, if there was a local student student up there at the local, you know, there's two colleges in the area, Bemidji State's up there. If they were, if they had an intern working in the county that I could push this off onto, that'd be great. But the fact is, you know, I'm not recruiting students to do anything. <laughs> it's not my my thing. Good. Thank you. Still cooking.